the sequel, the reimagining. In entertainment, we seem obsessed by these things. It's no secret that people are willing to pay to see a sequel or a reboot of something that they already like. That's the reason that these studios continue to propagate them and take in huge sums of money doing so. It's not like they're universally bad, but I think we can all agree that it'd be nice to see more original content released instead of sequels and reboots to things we've already grown tired of. There are of course some exceptions, and some really great ones at that. But largely, original storytelling will trump dug up reboots almost every time. And even if the original content falls short, at least they made an effort to contribute something new to the world. In the end, whether we enjoy this recent reboot and sequel fever or not, one thing is clear. We are far from the conclusion of this fad. So I want to take an in-depth look at this trend as it applies to the medium of animation. If we're going to get sequels and reboots to some of our favorite animated content anyways, I want to ask with this new series, how can it be pulled off and done well? And how can they avoid the dreaded, the source material was better? And for those that came away unscathed and actually created a good sequel or a fresh reboot, we can look at how they pulled it off. And with that, I want to welcome you to Retuned. Taking a look at the revamped, rebooted, and reanimated, this is Retuned. In 2006, we saw the release of Pixar's seventh film, Cars, and we asked ourselves, didn't Thomas and the Tank Engine already do this? But it's Pixar and we all went and saw it anyways. And we realized something. Cars is its own story much different from anything we've had before. I'll admit I didn't enjoy Cars quite as much on my first viewing, but later on, on my second viewing, I really fell in love with it, and I'd actually put it relatively high on a Pixar films list. Cars' central character is Lightning McQueen, and as we meet him, he's racing for the coveted Piston Cup. However, he can't seem to eke out a win, and comes in a three-way tie to be settled one week from then, between his nemesis Chick Hicks, voiced by Michael Keaton, and the hardened veteran Strip the King Weathers, voiced by actual NASCAR legend Richard Petty, also known as the King in the film, McQueen definitely has his work cut out for him. But as McQueen travels to the tiebreaker race, he gets accidentally dropped from his big rig and finds himself in a small town, which he then proceeds to accidentally destroy. He is now trapped in Radiator Springs, tied to a giant tar machine, forced to fix all the damages before he can leave. And it's right here in Little Radiator Springs where the heart of Cars is found. Sure, having a movie called Cars and having it be all about racing is just fine. Competition-based movies can be really intense and fun when you just want that home team to win so badly. I have to applaud Cars for what they did with Radiator Springs and not having this movie solely about racing. The film isn't just about McQueen training for a big race Rocky style. It's about him growing as a person, the uh, er, a car and helping Radiator Springs to grow as well. Radiator Springs is filled with colorful characters, most having a sort of stereotypical personality based on the type of vehicle that they are. The VW is a hippie, for example, the Jeep is a military guy, the lowrider is voiced by Cheech Marin, of course, and the hillbilly tow truck is voiced by Larry the Cable Guy? Wait a minute, did I say that right? You want to put Larry the Cable Guy in a Disney movie? Oh dear god, no. Hey Disney, guess what? Just because someone is a hick in real life doesn't mean they can voice one well in a movie. But there's just one small thing. Larry the Cable Guy is sensational as Mater. Rick? Shoo! I'm the world's best backwards driver. You just watch this right here, lover boy. The way he handles the character brings so much heart, I still honestly can't believe it myself. 
He delivers and then some on the emotional scale. He may be the comic relief, but he also provides the heart for the film and has become one of Disney's most beloved characters. I don't think Disney Infinity would have included cars at all as launch characters if not for people wanting to play as Mater. Let's not forget his very own spin-off series, and of course Cars 2. Bottom line, Toe Mater was certainly the breakout star in Cars, and one of the reasons that film is so touching and funny, but Owen Wilson also does a very solid job as the fast-paced racer, Lightning McQueen, to his credit. I want to touch on one scene in Cars that I really, really loved. A sequence set to the song Our Town, performed by James Taylor, we learned that Radiator Springs used to be a main stop on Route 66 until they were bypassed by a modern interstate, which caused the whole town to spiral downwards. This scene was just so heart-wrenching and well done, it really is the highlight of the movie. With their whole town rendered obsolete to save 10 minutes of driving, we can feel that these aren't just machines, but characters that want to have a purpose again in the world. So yeah, good luck not crying during this scene. In the end, McQueen learns from Radiator Springs and actually makes a real true best friend in Mater. He may not go on to win the final race for the Piston Cup, but instead he selflessly helps out a wrecked Strip Weathers cross the finish line for his very last race. But the best thing about it all, we don't care that McQueen doesn't win, because through his admirable acts, he brings business and life back to Radiator Springs, and even ends up getting offered the shiny new sponsorship that he'd been gunning for. I mean, he can win races in the future. That's what Cars 2 is for, right? Cars set itself up perfectly for a sequel. Lightning McQueen wasn't the most likable guy at the start of Cars, but by the end, we were ready to root for him. And with Cars 2, the audience wants to see McQueen, with his new friends by his side, make his next big run to win the Piston Cup. Sounds good, buy me a ticket! However, in the first five minutes of Cars 2, we already learned that McQueen has won four Piston Cups in between movies. Oh, okay. Well, then what's this movie going to be about? Well, I think the massive commercial success and positive reaction to Mater in the first film led them to say, I think we need to have this film about Mater. And then another guy said, but Mater's not a racer, so what could this story be about? And then the first guy was like, hmm, let's put a bunch of spies in the movie and then give Mater rocket boosters and a bunch of guns. And they were all like, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, that's a yeah, yeah. yeah. better idea of the plot to 2011's Cars 2, Lightning McQueen is challenged to a race by a flashy Italian race car to promote this new kind of alternative fuel. Unbeknownst to the racers, the fuel has been weaponized to destroy the racers and show the world that they should stick to gasoline. So now we have the involvement of spies who will try to come in and thwart it. Mater gets haplessly roped into the spies plot when they mistake him for an undercover agent. If this is sounding confusing and convoluted for a G-rated movie, well, it really is. In my opinion, this was completely the wrong turn for this film. But let me first say what I liked about this movie. Mater, for the first time, realizes that people see him as an idiot, and that for all of his life, people have been laughing at him and not with him. This realization is reached when he embarrasses McQueen and causes the first rift we see in their friendship. Talk to somebody and explain what happened. I could help. I don't need your help. I don't want your help. This was exactly the right idea. McQueen and Mater have a really interesting relationship, and it should have been more central to this movie. There are still loads of cute car puns and creative ways of naming cars similar to the first film. Also, for one scene when they were in Japan, they even snuck in some perfume to the background music, and I gotta give them props for that. 
The negatives of the film stem from one problem. Mater works extremely well as a secondary main character to McQueen, but when you push him to the forefront, things get pretty dicey. McQueen feels like a total side character in this movie. However, I will again commend Larry the Cable Guy. He does what he can to bring some fantastic life to Mater and puts Sir Michael Caine, voice of the main spy car, to shame. Michael Caine brings one of the laziest, most uninspired performances I've ever seen from an actor of that caliber. And it goes to show that just because someone is a good actor in real life doesn't mean they will be effective in voiceover. It's got all the action you would think of in a spy movie. But it's with cars. The action in this movie is fun and definitely bigger than the first. But what other Disney movie can you think of that has this many guns? Cars 2 is seriously violent. I mean, how can this be rated G? Yeah, it's Cars, so it's a bit less relatable than if it were humans, but Cars 2 has so many guns and so many killed cars that it just feels dark and weird. What they intended as silly action turned out as outright car murdering. I mean, did he just kill all of those cars on that ramp? Well, who can say for sure? But with this film, I was left asking, where are the scenes like Our Town? Where are the characters? Where is Lightning McQueen? I mean, he's on the cover, right? In the end, Cars 2 is a very bumpy ride. But they made their money back, and then some. So, with this film, we can quietly let the world of Cars fade away. Wait. What's that? Planes! Holy kachow! It's planes! Separated from Pixar this go-round, planes comes flying out of the gates. Uh, plane? Pun? <laughs> to try to bring some life back into the world of cars. Or the world above cars, I should say. Initially planned to go straight to video, a theatrical release for planes did not look promising. Dusty Crop Hopper is a crop dusting plane with big dreams of racing in the big leagues. His voice is provided by Dane Cook, who does a serviceable job, certainly not bad or totally phoned in like Michael Caine's. He wants to aspire to more than just what he's made for. It's a pretty basic story idea, which we've seen before, but that's certainly alright. Good movies often stem from a familiar framework. Dusty wants to enter the Wings Across the World race, and though we see him practicing in the crop fields and get to know that he's a very talented racer, I found it strange that he was even able to qualify. I mean, I may not know much about planes, but is there any way a crop dusting plane could be fast enough to beat real racing planes? But I don't really care about that, I'm willing to suspend my disbelief over that one. Dusty was also trained in part by an older veteran plane, which helps him get an extra edge in the competition. Although this relationship feels strikingly similar to Lightning McQueen and Doc Hudson, also a retired veteran racer who helps Lightning McQueen become better during his time in Radiator Springs. I will say to the credit of planes, they took great advantage of 3D, unlike most other films today. There's loads of POV shots during races, which is really fun if you do get to see it in 3D. Which I guess you won't, <laughs> if you haven't already seen it and you're watching this review, so I'm sorry. <laughs> With Dusty now qualified for the wings around the world, all he's got to do is race it. We deal far less with relationships in planes than we do in cars, though planes does introduce its fair share of characters. Similar to Radiator Springs, each international plane is stereotypically characterized. The Mexican plane El Chupacabra is an over-the-top romantic matador type. The British plane is a tea-drinking snob, etc., etc. The Wings Around the World race goes through many different countries, so the vast majority of the film takes place during the race, which I personally really liked. Something that would have been nice in Cars 2, we finally can really root for the protagonist to win the race, because that's the focus of the movie. Later on, in efforts to compete with the faster planes, Dusty removes his sprayer, the one thing that essentially makes him a crop duster. But to his dismay, it isn't enough, and he crashes in a rainstorm, unable to finish the race. 
But wait! With a contribution of spare parts from all the other racers, he's able to entirely rebuild himself and <gasps> win the race! Yeah! I've got to say, it feels pretty cool to see Dusty win the race, all things considered. I mean, we've never seen Lightning McQueen win the big race, so to speak. So to see the protagonist win a race, it's kind of nice. Planes certainly wasn't doing anything original story-wise, but they focused on one coherent plot and carried it out. Although the fact that Dusty had to change just about everything about himself in order to win seems to be kind of a weird message. It's like telling a pageant contestant, sure, you can be in the pageant, but you'll need extensive surgery to actually have a shot to win. <laughs> but I'm sure I'm overthinking it. Overall, I think Planes was a stronger film than Cars 2. It had real stakes, and it didn't have to deal with the roadblock, <coughs> car pun, of doing justice to beloved characters. So it came away with fewer offenses, and a plot that wasn't entirely silly. These two films, though, on the whole, have really missed the magic of what made Cars so incredible. Cars showed that a bunch of big-eyed automobiles can present a story that feels human. Planes made strides in the right direction, and maybe, just maybe, the upcoming Planes sequel... Yes, you heard me correctly. Planes, Fire and Rescue... Oh... Maybe this sequel can take a look back at Cars and what made it work so well. Because, like I said, People are going to keep seeing these sequels and spin-offs, so hopefully this time they bring a little bit of heart along with the horsepower. Next time on Retuned.